Crazy Stupid Podcast. This is your first time watching. We love it. If you could hit that subscribe button, like this video, and the bell so that you are aware of when we post things. It's been a big week. We saw the long awaited conclusion to the Attack on Titan. The SAG after strike is done. And of course, there was another episode of JJK, but it was like a big episode. So I guess maybe we start with Attack on Titan yeah. and then we jump into JJK. So it's over. It is done. I feel like I don't feel how I should feel. I've been feeling like this all week. There was too much time. Too much time passed, and then it was just like a one episode event. For me, the wait was the same as it would be between any season wait. We binged the show late, mm -hmm. and we finished it like sometime, like late last year, I think. Yeah. So like, it was the normal amount of time to wait for another season, but because it wasn't another season, it was just another episode. Were you not like emotionally connected? to what was happening. Like the, 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 the scenes that you were supposed to feel things, were you feeling things, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Not what I would have expected and not what I think I would have felt had this episode just aired with the rest of the show, with the rest of the last season. Mm. Because when I was binging the show, I was in it. Like I was very invested, very attached to all these characters, but then it just was so long. And then like, I, I don't know, I just like, it. It didn't land the way I thought, the way I wanted it to land. And I don't think it's because the episode made any mistakes. I think I just mentally was very disconnected from this entire world. And there wasn't enough time in the episode to re, in like a single episode to reconnect. I think the 80, 85 minute approach did help for me because the first half, I think I was feeling a little bit of what you were, what you were feeling. The second half, I think I was, I was, I was fully in it. Okay. Um, I'm glad that you got that. Yeah. And I think we, we talked a little bit about this after we watched it. The scenes with Levi closing his story arc, completing his mission, seeing Hanji and Erwin and Sasha and all the other comrades that he lost. I felt the weight of that because it tied me back to season three, which is what I felt was the best season in my opinion because it focused so much on this core group of people who are just trying to figure out why their lives are always in danger, you know? So that I think was probably the strongest point. Definitely teared up when he saw them and then uh, Connie and John saw Sasha as well. I've got mixed feelings about the, the Aaron, Armin, and Mikasa. I was definitely sad. I feel like they should be mad at Aaron a little bit. Granted, I understand the perspective of he gave, he tried to give them more time and he did give them more time to live. And in the world's perspective, it's time for us to wipe them all out. So I'm trying to see like from their perspective, how they're, they're sort of holding both of these truths together of like 80% or our extinction, like. Yeah, I do wish that we'd had a little bit more time because right. I think the thing that is missing is that what everybody has been spending this past year talking about was the morality of Aaron's decision. And in the finale, it was discussed in that Aaron explained himself. But like, I think the moral question that we were all left with was not wrestled with. Armin shows a lot of anger and frustration at Aaron as he's explaining, like, the, especially when he hears 80%. I think I just needed maybe more time with that, with them just sitting with Aaron's plan a bit. The way that they talk about Aaron is kind of like, he did this thing that was like a bit of a nuisance. Like when they're on that ship, like, oh, Aaron left us this This suicidal brat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're still like kind of kiki ki Yes. Now that could just be, you know, the traumatic dark humor kicks in. That's probably just, that's how they're coping with it. That That's a legitimate But like case. nobody called him a monster. Nobody was like, right. you did this monstrous yeah. thing. And to me, I, I feel like that's why, I don't know if the show's stance is that clear. And I, I feel like the, one of the things that I take issue with, which like, listen, this was the narrative choice that they made and it, it is what it is. I think that the inevitability of it makes the stance 
of the show on Aaron's actions sort of like hazy. The framing of it was already like, either we kill the entire planet or we are completely wiped out. And that already to me was like a, okay, like, <laughs> like you kind of put us in a corner here, like this is. I'm wondering if this is his take, his perspective on just like the radicalization of people where I think in, in Aaron's perspective, like the nihilism probably kicks in and he sees past, present and future, right? And he realizes like what we saw during the credits is what Aaron sees. Right. And so in his mind, it's not about eliminating, eliminating war because from what he saw, that's never going to go away. And so the only choice is to eliminate people. He only gets to that point because of what happened in his story. The thing is like in radicalization, there's still the aspect of I've been radicalized and so I'm making these choices, but there's still choices. Yeah. I think the thing that sort of makes it kind of weird to me is that essentially what they've revealed to us is that there was no choice. You know what I think also might maybe explain this is he does not have free will, not because those are like the philosophical rules of this universe, but because he is the entity limiting his own free will. Like in all iterations of past, present, and future, the way that things have played out in the loop. In that moment with Ramsey, that anger is defining his past, present, and future self all at one time, because for him, it's all at the same time. And so even if his future self understands like this, this is going to be really horrific, that other self is still in that space. You know what I mean? So like like maybe, his present self is still, right. so, is still there in the moment. Right. So maybe he is the entity and the being limiting his own free will because all of these versions of himself are existing at the same time for him and his reality. And he did say that. He said said my mind has gotten very mixed up essentially yeah. because everything's happening all at once yeah there is a lot of tragedy in and i think that does lend itself more to the point that you were saying about radicalization and nihilism his own nihilism is what is limited it was what is limiting his ability to act outside of that yeah even when he's removed from it so that nihilism is what sort of in in aaron's case creates that lack of free will and that loop yeah. Yeah. That hits heavy for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take that. That hits heavy for me. And it said that he tried. The emotions start to pick back up for me in that moment because it's like all of Aaron's humanity had not been lost because we see that he was trying. But then the nihilism kicks in again because of what he saw throughout, you know, time and space. A reoccurring theme that we saw earlier in the first three seasons was that this idea of like, if you win, you live. If you lose, you die. If you don't fight, you can't win. Even that is sort of like in a loop, right? Of like, well, if you don't do this, it's gonna happen. If you don't do this, it's gonna happen and so on and so forth. From the beginning of the show, that is all they have been taught since the island was attacked. So he literally has no other framework really to even in some ways conceptualize truly other options. And then he unlocks all, you know, the foundling in the, the attack titans powers. He sees what happens past, present, and future. And I think these two things combining in and of itself lend a hand to each other also. I also think it's kind of like the loop is extending throughout the series, but it's never breaking. Yeah. So like every time you, he or we as viewers get to a point that we think would break the loop that they're currently in, it actually what we realize is just like, actually this is just making the loop a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, for like as viewers and for the characters, going to the basement and discovering the truth about the outside world felt like a big thing, big thing. Prior to that, they were in this loop of like, well, like it was literally seasons of being Loops, like, trying well, to defeat Titans. yeah, the Titans are gonna come and take down this wall and now we're all gonna have to shrink into this other circle, which also like the literally the whole first season is like literally taking place in literal. For a season. literal circle, yeah. And I was like, okay, now we have to go into the next wall and then a Titan's gonna come and break that wall. I have to go to this one. Oh, now we have to try to, oh, now he can like, he can use the Titan power to like fix the wall, the whatever. Loop, uh, the loop of even Erwin saying, 
the fate of humanity rests in this moment <laughs> over and over and over again. Like they were just literally, and then like you think you get to this moment that's like, ooh, this is it. Like this is this is the thing that's gonna shift it all. And it does shift it all, but it's just a bigger loop. Now it's like, right. oh, and now I just have a bigger understanding of this loop that's taking place outside of the walls and how that is contributing to what's going on here. And then he gets access to seeing past, present, future. And he realizes that all of this for all of humanity, not just for Eldians, is going to be an eternal loop. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we loop right back to the beginning of it all with somebody walking <laughs> into, into that, that tree. tree. My God. It, it is, uh, it's realistic for how humanity has gone so far. It did leave me feeling very, my emotions felt very heavy at the end. Yeah. I which, is, think... which is fair. You, you're not obligated to have a happy ending. I mean, personally, I thought the ending was happier than I expected because... Uh, with them being annihilated? <laughs> no, well, okay, like, I feel like they intentionally showed that to us as like a, not a post credit, but like, a, it was kind of like a little outside of the like main narrative of the show. Like, they gave us an ending for the characters that we've known. And that ending for, like, nobody died, like, no, right? Nobody died besides Aaron. Yeah. Like all of the people that were still surviving alive at the beginning of this episode stayed alive through to the through this battle, and then all of them get to live out their lives, assuming we can assume in like relative peace, like compared to what they are used to. I feel like that's kind of Aaron was like, well, if that's the only thing I can, this is my best option. Yeah, I feel like yeah, he was like. I can't fix it all. I can at least try to get them this. Yeah. That is a loop ending for them. Um, I do want to talk about Amir. She continued to follow his orders. She because she loves him. When, when he hinted in the pads and Zeke was like, I couldn't figure out why Amir would continue to follow the wishes of this man who oppressed her and enslaved her, but Aaron was able to figure it out. And in my mind, I was like, I hope the reason is not love. I literally, in my mind, thought that in that moment, I said, please don't let that be it. And that's exactly what they did. And they, they, tried, they tried to like mirror it with like Mikasa, and I'm like. And they didn't flesh it out at all. I'm just supposed to believe inexplicably that this enslaved woman loved her master. I'm sorry. If you're gonna do that, you need to explain something. You need to give us some, some a little bit more narrative of them interacting or something. I mean, See, that's the thing. There was nothing there. Maybe, maybe they give us like three or four episodes, get a little bit more of that stuff. Like, and 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 they, that that's part of sometimes story thing. Uh, is a little bit with Lost. We're like, you don't always get all the lore, and that can be a little frustrating. But there are certain moments where lore feels necessary for everything to make not sense of knowing everything, but it's sense of like the yes, yeah, because yes. that was not believable to me. Yeah. And I even saw people like on a Reddit post from when the manga finished talking about this. And they were talking about how people thought that there was going to be a connection between Historia and Emir because there was like um, some like symbolic mirroring. Like there was images of the, okay, like remember, that I think it's in the similar. book, yeah. like the Titan like leaning down mm -hmm. to the girl that's Emir. And then there was a, a image of a titan leaning down to Historia on a horse that was yeah. like almost identical. There was like lots of mirroring there and people thought that there was gonna be a connection there. I think people thought that like she was gonna give birth to like a, the reincarnation of a mirror, like her mm. baby would be like a And then there was like nothing there and then the end they decided to tie Mikasa's story to Emir in like a very sort of honestly like, kind of sloppy way that just like, because I honestly don't even think that Mikasa's situation is the same as Emir's. No, Aaron was not abusive to Mikasa in any remotely way that's similar to you being a, a literally a, sa a slave, sex slave to this king, because you're literally breeding him heirs. And I, I was trying to search for something there, like some sort of meaning there, and I just can't, I kept coming up empty. Like, I don't really know why you would choose to do that other than I just need something to tie this up. That's kind of what it feels he, like. He did apologize for the end. <laughs> No, I think the context is a little bit different. I think it's more so sorry of like, I couldn't live up to the expectations. Not sorry of like, yeah, I know I fucked up, but like, it's too late. Like, in my mind, those those kind of mean two different things. Yeah. But I, I still enjoy it. I saw a couple of people use the word satisfied. I think I would agree with that. It's worth something to me because it was a good episode. 
that wrapped up a fucking phenomenal TV show. All right, let's jump to JJK. I didn't think they'd be able to top the UG versus Choso fight, and they fucking did it in my mind. Oh, I, I figured that they would once Sakuni was there because he's just so Yo. unmatched. You caught how them girls, they had to tell themselves to breathe mm -hmm. in the previous episode. You know how scared you gotta be to tell yourself to breathe? That means your, your bodily functions have stopped to that capacity where you're not even doing things that are supposed to work on their own. That is in, like my brain cannot comprehend that kind of fear, bro. That's crazy to me. <laughs> crazy. My God. Listen, 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 listen. Cause the strike is over and I feel like we need to talk about this. What JJK has done with Jogo has been so impressive. Like immaculate writing. Mm -hmm. Because when we were first introduced to him, I, as someone that did not read the manga, watched the first few episodes in season one and was like, oh, it's giving like the first villain that's kind of goofy at the beginning of like a Marvel movie that you're not supposed to take that seriously, right? To sort of get things started and to show you the scale and scope of how powerful some of your favorite characters are, uh, yeah. right? That is not Jogo. <laughs> No, he was actually one of the big bads before the big, I, big bad. And what's crazy, and I've seen a lot of people say this also, we really only thought that because he went up against Gojo. Yeah. More character development as the season has gone on. Like he's the one that's dropping the lines. A lot of it is like, we're the hu real humans. Humans try to ignore these emotions and that's what makes us more like essentially authentic in comparison to humans. He talks a lot about wanting to create this sense of community and belonging amongst other curses. He then evokes emotions that are in some ways kind of contrary to like his existence. When he goes to the afterlife. And he starts to cry. Yeah. You're getting all of that and you, I felt sad mm -hmm. when he's essentially saying these goodbyes of like, we're not going to be the same, but at least we'll still get to see each other at some point in whatever afterlife or new world that he's describing. I really, I enjoy Enjoy that moment that Jogo has with Sukuna because I think Sukuna was only half right with what he surmised with what their plan is of like you don't just want to be recognized as humans you want their spot their, you want status. their status yeah I think part of that is true but I also think due to Jogo crying when Sukuna gives him that semi compliment I also think what he's looking for is what a lot of just normal human beings are looking for is like validation of your existence and self-worth, right? Oh. He does not tear up at all at any other moment until Takuna comes in and says, listen, you should be proud. I've gone up against the best of them and you're up there with them. Now, granted, no one can really beat Sakuna, but him saying that, that's what made Jogo tear up. This idea that I think what we're seeing with some of these curses, especially with Dagon, Jogo, and, and Hanami, is this idea of what makes a human, human. Using this idea of, of curses that are created from the negative emotions is probably more a nihilistic approach of like, that's what really humanity is. Like all of the stuff that they don't like to really admit about themselves, but even in those worst examples, you can still find some humanity in them, which is what I think those teary eyes is really supposed to make us feel. I thought that that is profound writing and it subverted the expectations. And it kind of reminded me of like Spot in like Across the Spider-Verse where like, you're not supposed to take him that seriously at first. Mm -hmm. And then later on you get so much more as you're like, oh, this is someone serious. Mm -hmm. So I just like, Got to tip my hat to the writing there, man. I feel like we there. now have another situation. It's like, listen, it's like we now have the Gojo situation, but flipped. It's like before with Gojo, it's like you're just so good that like nothing can be serious while you're around because like we know you can handle everything. Now with Sukuna, it's like you're just so bad that like there's like not even like a ounce of hope. Oh. Like, like, no, like there's. Like nobody this can do anything. Half of that. I also town. want to say, Gojo, he was real confident that he would win. I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gojo, I think we need. I'm not so.
so certain. Now, granted, both of them kind of defeated Joku with ease, but I don't know, man. No, I, 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 I don't, I don't think it's the same because here's the thing: Gojo is still bound by some rules. You mean like moral rules? No, like literal, like physical rules of like how his thing, like how. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, to yeah, me, yeah, yeah. what they have presented as Sukuna is that like he like can do whatever. And they 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 strongly hinted at that where he was like, I thought all humans knew this, and they, he didn't really answer. But then he says, "But you're a curse, so you probably don't know." And it looked like he was mimicking. Yeah. Jogo's curse, which I will say is kind of similar to what Utah did in JJK Zero, where he mimicked what's his name, the voice curse technique that he did. So uh, I, but there, there's yeah. a little bit of that later on. But I'm, I'm not sure if that is where we're going. But I thought that was was kind of similar. Uh, there's a reoccurring theme of of self worth in JJK that has sort of shown itself often. We talked a little bit about that with Jogo when he tears up after he, Sukuna essentially says that you should be proud. But I think the self-worth also kicks in with characters like Maki, who she does not have, you know, curse ability. And so the self-worth for her in terms of what is being told by her, by the Zenin clan, I think is, is hit. I also think that applies to Toji as well, because when he says things like, not that I care, like I don't really care that they didn't accept me because I don't have curse ability. I don't think he's being truthful. I don't know if it's the right decision, but he was okay with Fushiguro being a part of that clan because that would be a better life for him than it was for Toji. I think what Sukuna was getting at is a myth that I think humanity falls into that trap often of like sometimes like our self-worth is done, is measured by like the comparison of others, right? And I don't know if that is a sustainable way to sort of measure yourself for it because it's a, one, it's a little bit toxic. It can be sometimes problematic and it can lead to you making decisions that you may, you know, ultimately re regret later on. And I think how they've been exploring that, that's been very impressive. Toji, he's wrestling with that body. You know, it doesn't really belong to him. He's okay with exiting that, the wrestle, once he finds out that his son kept his name instead of taking Zen in. Uh -huh. You know, and so he's like, all right, I'm able to, to rest now. The Marvels. I had a great time. I did. I I will say, I think out of everyone on that casting, they're all great. But I think Iman Villani is probably like the best one. I think the, the humor lands for her, yeah, which doesn't so always, you know, Marvel will hit or miss there. I think her screen presence is probably the strongest out of everyone there on the screen. I think the film was maybe just a little bit too short because we weren't able to flesh out certain characters that I think could have helped the overall quality of the film. When it's the three of them, just like cracking jokes, vibing, trying to figure shit out, that's where I'm like, oh, this is good. Uh, and surprisingly, some of those fight scenes were actually kind of impressive. I don't know if you saw the trailer, but like they're like switching back and forth between each other because the powers are like confusing them and whatnot. Um, not to say too much about like the lore there, but that part was, was really good. But now the strike was over, I, I kind of wanted to, to touch on like one thing that's sort of related to the film because like everybody's just kind of talking about like the state of the MCU and like how things are looking right now. I do think that there are like, there's two main things that we have to remember about the MCU. Obviously the first is COVID, right? That played a huge role in reshoots, they had to cut time and then they had to cut scenes from TV shows and probably things with movies. And so I think that probably has played a little bit role of like, not quality of individual films, but like the state of like, what are we even doing here? I do think the second thing that I haven't seen a lot of, I haven't seen enough people mention, there have been some, but not enough, is the loss of Chadwick Boseman. I think that we have, for some people, we have underrated how big that was at the time in which we lost him because He's supposed to take up the mantle, right? We get him in Civil War, everyone loves, you know, Chadwick Boseman. We get Black Panther, massive success. It was nominated for Oscars, it won Oscars, like, it, like, broke money at the box office, and so Marvel's like, all right, we can hand the keys off to this guy. But we end up losing him at the same time characters leave after Endgame. And so the person that they're supposed to send off the mantle to is no longer here and i've seen some people talk about like there's no face of the mcu right now yeah that's i think it we lost them 
-hmm. right? And like it could be Spider Man, but you know the contractual obligations say, with that's Sony. The other thing. At the same time, there was all that weird stuff. Right, so that made it kind of weird. So they can't bet too much on him. Yeah, Doctor Strange. It's a little too much. It's a little too much. I just don't think he got it. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what they can do with, with the new Captain America, Sam Wilson. I, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. I, I love Anthony Mackie. But I don't it's going to be tough. It. It's going to be tough. <laughs> I don't think he got it. Chadwick Boseman was the perfect choice. He he had the charisma, he had the screen presence, he had the swag, he had everything that you were looking for. You put him on a night on a late night show and he's lighting up the room. He does, you know, speaking engagements at, at universities. He was he was the face. He had everything that you were looking for. And to have that removed while you were exiting so many of your main characters i think that that part has been a little understated as to how much that hurt what they were doing because like yeah, earlier on i never really considered that because i think people just thought it was like it only impacted the black panther story like, right but like, it, it, kind it of... hurt it hurt the mcu a lot because think back to like all right yeah he was the first one to come through in, yeah i was, I was gonna say that too in portals which is intentional yeah. i will say to have black panther be the one to come out first but like when if, if you were to think back to like you know when all this first started you had iron man massive success but then we were hit with like hulk thor one eh, you know kind of mixed with how people feel about it i know a lot of people don't like the hulk but there are some, there are some Actually, fans, I'm, some people. I don't think I ever watched it, I'm gonna be honest. All right, we'll see, then there's that. <laughs> but even, even with all of that, it wasn't as, it, clearly they both were not as successful as Iron Man. You could still say, well, we still got Iron Man coming out, right? That was a consistent thing throughout the entire MCU. Like whenever there was like a movie that like, it was like a little mixed with like how people were feeling, Ant-Man, Captain Marvel, Doctor Strange was, you know, it was all right. Thor, Dark World, you always do that. Like, all right, but I'm gonna look at my calendar and I know that there's gonna be that one character that everyone can get behind. Right now, we don't have that. And that was supposed to be T'Challa, which, it's, it's going to be hard to do that. It's going to be hard to do that, to replace that, because it, just how so abruptly it was sort of taken away, obviously, may he rest in peace. But once I left that theater, that was something that I thought about. I'm like, yeah, I, people aren't talking about that enough. It's the timing and when we lost him right after Endgame. You lost three main characters, really, instead of just two with Tony and Cap. You don't think Shuri could do it? If they I, really went all in and tried, I they think, really baked on that. I think it's hard for the second person to come in, which is why what made the Spider-Verse films so, I, 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 it's still hard for me to process because Miles is like second place really in terms of like who was created first. Peter Parker comes in, but everyone loves Miles Morales now. I So it is, it is possible because I think Spider-Verse has made the blueprint I haven't seen anyone do it as well as them. Well, they also did it, um, set, they did their own thing. They didn't intro it. Like, I don't think if they intro it, intro to Miles Morales into the MCU right now, that that would happen. I think it would depend. I think Miles Morales, his name right now is so big. Yeah, well, okay, let me say, right now, maybe, but if before Into the Spider-Verse, yes. if they had intro yes. Miles Morales right. into the MCU, right. I don't think that that would have happened. I think it, part of why it worked for Into the Spider Race was because it was apart mm -hmm. from, it was like its own thing over a year. Yeah. And it was just so good. And I, it can't, I can't be Thor. I love Chris Hemsworth, but he's, well, a, isn't he? a god is not as relatable to someone like the child. I think. But also I feel like we don't even really know 100% if there's going to be more of those movies. There is. Yeah, yeah, they announced it. Oh, okay. They, it. they didn't announce it. News outlets have so, oh, okay. so maybe not, but that's, that's what it We're looking around and we're like, I don't know, Moon Knight, a little, a little too spooky, you know? I also think um, none of their feature projects have been as good as Black Panther. Well, that's the other thing too. I just think, I think that has a big part of that. I think that plays a large part in the emotional attachments that people form with the characters. Part of it was like, I mean, obviously his charm and everything is also part of what made the movie so good. And part of what made people so attached to him, but also 
his movie was such a cultural moment. It was like a cultural shift that like none of the others have had. No. And um, not even close. Not even close. He, Captain Marvel made a billion, and it did not feel like it was as big as Black Panther. No, I, Captain Marvel. I think a lot of why it made a billion was because of its timing. It was right after. It was that thing between Endgame, and we were trying also, to figure out what was going on. Girls love Captain Marvel too. Though. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it just like it doesn't feel like I don't know. I just, I, the movie just wasn't as good to me. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Um. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Like, who who exactly right now could we say is like the face of the MCU? I don't know. And like, you kind of need one. I know it's like a goofy example to look to, of like you know WWE, because obviously you know it's like fake wrestling. But there's always like a guy who that you can look to and say, yeah, there's all of this talent that helps perform in the ring, but. The one person that's supposed to be like, you know, like the box office. Yeah. That's who you go for. Michael Jordan, there's Tom Brady, there's LeBron, too. you know what I'm saying? So. I think you have a couple of choices. I think one, you bring in a new, a new MC character that we haven't seen on the screen before and you cast an extremely, extremely charming individual. Do you do that right now or do you wait? Because people, people are hinting at it, maybe like there might be like a bit of a reset after Secret Wars, and maybe that's probably where they'll do what you're suggesting. Oh, I, I don't, I'm not sure about time. I'm just saying like that's an option. Yeah. Or I feel like you could choose somebody that you have now, but you just have to like really market it. Like I. It has to be good. And I, yeah, you have to market, and you also have to be like, we're going to make this movie like a really good film. Like I feel like with Black Panther, they were like, this is going to be a really good film. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. And I feel like the and it's Some not cheat, maybe there's nothing wrong with um maybe but but you see then like we don't hear about them afterwards they just yeah Shang Chi was successful like you have to really go for it I also and we feel don't even like know where he's at it can be a girl I just I feel like you guys are scared to do that but I feel like you could. I also think we've only had one example of it with 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 Carol Danvers, and I don't know if they really went all in. No, I mean you can always well, tell. No, I, yeah, you can always tell. I feel like with Marvel when they're like, "This movie, we're like, th this is a film. We're yeah. making this serious." And when they're like, "This is a fun superhero movie to fill in some narrative gaps." Ant Man and the Wasp. You can tell, right? Based on like who they put on the project and how much goes into it. You can always tell, like with Black Panther, with Infinity War, with Endgame, with Winter Soldier, um, Winter Soldier Civil War. with Civil War, I and, with, um, and with um, No Way Home. Yes. You can tell that those are projects where they're like, we're going all in. We want this to be a cultural moment versus uh, like the Ant-Man films or like things like that that's just like, yeah, this is just like, it's and it's nothing wrong with that. Like Marvel movies don't have to be like, freaking phenomenal every time it's, it is true like this is just fun superhero stuff like we don't need to take that seriously so there's nothing wrong with it but you can just tell that that well, you can mm -hmm. tell the difference so if you want to do this maybe take a character like i feel like what this girl um uh iman villani she got star power if you give her a chance i think her but you're playing her as like a fun little you know like you're, you're playing her story as like it just like okay well i'll say this teen. are you do you plan on watching the film? I think so, yeah. Uh, this is not a spoiler, because I want to make sure this stays spoiler free. I would not be surprised if she gets bigger in terms of importance. Okay. She has a talent, she could do it. Same thing, I, I feel like Tom Holland could do it too if, if it wasn't for all the weird stuff going on. I think um, either way, it, it should still problem. Ah, see, that's the thing. I don't think Marvel wants that drama. No, I know. They're, they're not going to do it because of what's going on. And that's why I I think we won't get a main face of the MCU until after Secret Wars because of everything that we just outlined. I think if you try to bring in someone new right now, it's going to feel a little bit forced. If you try to bring up a character right now, it's going to be hard because it's going to be the constant comparisons. And I think... That isn't the kind of noise that helps your brand as you're trying to invest into a character. 
And so I think what we'll probably see with Secret Wars is just the culmination of everything with MCU, with Fox, um, with other characters that we've probably seen with like Daredevil and all of that. I kind of forgot what is the Secret Wars. It's kind of like the multiversal wars kind of clashing okay. together. That's generally speaking, that's, that's sort of what, what happens there. You, you know, we get your Fantastic Four and then I think a reset will, will happen. They might also see how some of those castings play with audiences and then they might pluck somebody from there. All right, y'all. It's been fun. Thank you all so much again. We will see you all next time. Peace out, y'all. Mm -hmm.